Now that we've reviewed some of the basics of game theory, um, we're going to talk about two more models of um, behavior in oligopoly. Um, and we're again focused on situations in which there's just two firms, which we would call a duopoly. Okay, so uh, we're gonna start with Cournot. So Cournot duopoly, um, we have two firms that compete not on price, but now on quantity, all right? So we wanna think about firms that compete on quantity. So each firm observes the demand function for the market, and they know that the quantity they produce plus the quantity that the other firm produces uh, will determine in the end the market price. So in this example, we have two firms. They have this simple market demand curve. Each firm then faces an individual demand curve, which is um, P equals 100 minus Q1 minus Q2, because Q1 plus Q2 is equivalent to the market quantity. Um, so both firms in this example have the same production costs. Marginal cost is equal to 10. And we want to think about how these firms will approach this situation. So what happens here is that the firm wants to think about their demand given the other firm's quantity. So first let's start by imagining firm one's problem if firm two produces nothing. If firm two produces nothing, then firm one observes the entire demand function, the residual demand for firm one is going to be P equals 100 minus Q1, right? They get the whole market to themselves. Um, they would then observe a marginal revenue curve of 100 minus 2Q1 and set that equal to marginal cost and then maximize profit by producing some quantity. Now, that's only if Q2 is equal to zero. If Q2 is equal to something else, we're gonna get a different answer, right? So say Q2 is equal to 40. Now, firm one is going to have a residual demand curve is going to have a residual demand curve of um, P equals 100 minus Q1 minus 40. So that's 60 minus Q1. So marginal revenue would be 60 minus 2Q1. And then um, we set that equal to marginal cost. and we get a different optimal quantity, right? So the optimal quantity for firm one depends on what firm two is doing. But given Q2, we can solve for the optimal profit maximizing choice for firm one, right? So we wanna basically go through this method again except this time we wanna leave Q2 not as one particular number, but as a variable, okay? It represents a number, um, but we just hold that constant and then make firm one's decision based on Q, whatever value of Q2 we have, right? So we're gonna leave this generically um, as Q2. So firm one's residual demand function would be uh, 100 minus Q1 minus Q2, okay? Then we would have total revenue is equal to, we're gonna multiply all of that by Q1. So we got 100 minus Q, oops, Q1 minus Q1 squared minus Q2 times Q1. Then we take marginal revenue, that's 100, I'm gonna move this over now, minus Q2, minus 2Q1. 
and we set that equal to marginal cost, so set it equal to 10, we get 90 equals, uh, we want to solve for Q1 here. So 90 minus Q2 is equal to 2Q1. So then Q1 is going to be equal to 45 minus 1 half Q2. Okay. So this is what we call a reaction function. Okay. Let's say that's R1, the reaction function for firm one, where the reaction function is a function that describes the optimal choice of output for firm one as a function of the choice of output for firm two. So based on what firm two does, now we know what the best option is for firm one. And um, this problem is symmetrical. In other words, both firms have the same um, problem, the same residual demand equation and the same marginal cost. So I know the reaction function for firm two is going to be kind of the opposite here of what I have, right? The same for um, firm two, Q2 will equal 45 minus one half Q2. And you can go through and um, work that out for yourself to show yourself that that's correct. Um, but that's what's going on here. If the firms had different marginal cost functions, then the reaction functions would be different. Um, and we would just work both of those out. Okay, so we've got our reaction functions and we can actually plot the reaction functions. Here I have a graph with Q1 on the y-axis and Q2 on the x-axis. So um, we can graph, um, let's see, firm one's reaction function is going to be, right, 45 minus, one half Q, so it goes to 90. So this is the reaction function for firm one. The reaction function for firm two is gonna start at 45 here on the x-axis and then 90 on the y-axis, so that's R2. And um, let me just highlight these in different colors. So we have reaction function for firm one and reaction function for firm two. And um, the Nash equilibrium in this type of a model occurs where the reaction functions intersect, okay? The Nash equilibrium occurs where the two reaction functions intersect. All right, so let's find that point and then I'll show you why that is, okay? Remember that our Nash equilibrium is the situation in which given what the other person is doing, I am doing my best, right? Like I have the best possible outcome holding constant what everyone else is doing. So that's true when the reaction functions intersect because if uh, Q2 is equal to this quantity, then the best choice for Q1 is this quantity. And if Q1 is this quantity, the best choice for Q2 is also that quantity, right? So that's what my reaction functions are telling me. Um, all right, so let's solve for that point. Our reaction functions give us two equations and two unknowns. So um, we can use them just by combining them to solve for the Nash equilibrium. So I've got Q1 equals 45 minus one half Q, and I know Q2 is equal to 45 minus one half, oh, that should be Q1, sorry. And so I'm gonna just plug that in. So I get Q1 equals 45 minus one half times 45 minus one half Q1, right? Now I just have an equation with Q1, so I can solve for that variable. Okay, so I've got Q1 is equal to 45 minus 22.5 plus, right? Because I've got a minus minus, and then one half times one half is one fourth Q1. 
All right, so if I move that to the other side, I get 3 fourths or 0.75 Q1 equals 22.5. So Q1 is gonna be equal to 30. And then I can plug that back into the reaction function for Q2. And uh, because this problem is symmetrical, it, it's also gonna be 30. Um, but like I said, if the firms had different marginal cost functions, then it would not necessarily be symmetrical. Okay, so that's this point here where the two reaction functions intersect. And, um, and I just wanna give you a sense of how these reaction functions work, right? So let's suppose that um, we start out with Q2 is equal to 80. So if Q2 is equal to 80, firm one is gonna see that and bake their profit maximizing choice based on that quantity. So um, they would say Q1 is gonna be equal to five. Okay, well, if Q2, if firm two knows that, that Q1 will be five, they observe that and their best choice becomes something else. Forty-two point five, right? And then firm one observes that, and their best choice becomes something else. And so, what happens is, like, if we start out somewhere that's not the Nash equilibrium, then we go through this iterative process, right, approaching the Nash equilibrium, and then we eventually reach the Nash equilibrium here, where given what the other person is doing, I'm producing my optimal quantity, and given what I'm doing, the other person is producing their optimal quantity. Okay, so <laughs> how do the predictions of Cournot uh, compare to what we saw before, right, with Bertrand? Um, we saw that firms could either form a cartel, behave like a monopoly and earn monopoly profits, or they could compete and earn zero profit. And we predicted that their incentives would lead them towards competition. Um, in this model, we end up somewhere that's not quite monopoly and not quite competition. So let's see how that works out. Okay, so if we have um, this set up, right, I figured out that my total market quantity is going to be 60, right? Because Q1 is making 30, Q2 is making 30. And so I can then solve for the price in the market. The price in the market will end up being 40. So I can calculate my profit in this Corno duopoly. Profit will be 40 times, and I'm going to do this for each firm, and then we can just double it to get market profit. So 40 times 30 minus my marginal cost is 10, and I don't have any fixed cost. So I've got um, 40 times 30 minus 10 times 30, which gives me $900 in profit for each firm or 1800 for the market. All right, so if I draw my demand curve here, I've got 100 minus Q, I got my marginal cost is 10. And then um, the monopoly outcome is where we set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. So that would be Q equals 45 and P equals 55. So 
So that would be this point here. All right, 45.55 is our monopoly outcome. That's not where we are with this corno duopoly. With the corno duopoly, we are producing um, 60. And we have a price of 40. So our overall market profits here are less than in Monopoly, um, but they're gonna be more than if we had competition or if um, we got to competition through the Bertrand model. Okay, so here we have profit equal to 1800. And with the Monopoly, you can see profit would be uh, 55 times 45 minus 10 times 45 is equal to 2025. Okay. All right. So Corneau's model is better than uh, Monopoly for consumers. Um, we get less profit, right, but more trade. So that's higher consumer surplus. We'll get one more model um, that's very similar to Corneau um, in the next video. Um, and then we'll compare all of these outcomes.